<clears throat> Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'll be um, uh, presenting work um, uh, done at Rigetti and, and trying to summarize um, a number of, of uh, I think, interesting applications results that um, may be of interest to, to NERSC users, um, as well as some ideas around system design that they're working on. Um, the work that I'm showing is, uh, you know, a, a huge uh, collaboration, um, uh, particular scientist um, from LBL who's now at Rigetti, um, who contributed uh, significantly to, to the content and is worth calling out as uh, Maxime Dupont um, with uh, the archive references, uh, as you see here. Great, so um, at Rigetti, you know, we're building, uh, building out quantum computers uh, in order to, you know, solve important problems that are out there. Um, we really see uh, this kind of transition to a useful um, quantum computing industry as, um, uh, you know, proceeding in a, in a, in a couple different steps. Um, right now, as, as, as we see it, um, together with our partners, kind of in this era of um, exploring use cases with this kind of emerging uh, potential for, for quantum advantage, where a lot of our work today is oriented towards um, prototypes and benchmarks. <clears throat> the, um, the shift towards uh, narrow quantum advantage is, is one that we're you know, very focused on uh, today, um, where we're looking at um, improvements to accuracy, speed, or cost um, as kind of key benchmarks. Um, so a lot of this is uh, based on uh, heuristics, um, but a lot of it is, I think, also uh, has the potential to be guided by, you know, collaborations uh, like, like we have ongoing with uh, Perlmutter, and we'll, we'll share a little bit about uh, that as we go. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, uh, the North Star continues to be this kind of fault tolerant era. Um, I won't be talking on uh, any of our work on uh, quantum error correction today, um, but again, we kind of see this as a continuous transition from these you know, benchmarking prototypes to now actually seeing some advantage against those benchmarks, um, you know, as, as we work to, to underpin things uh, with, with real kind of quantum error correction. Um, so Rigetti, we, uh, just for those of you who don't know, uh, we do superconducting uh, quantum processors. We make our own chips um, down in Fremont, and then we integrate those in our data center uh, in Berkeley, just down the hill uh, from NERSC. Um, our public roadmap uh, is shown here. Um, uh, just last year, we, um, uh, transition from a single uh, chip 40 qubit system to our first multi-chip platform. So our 80 qubit processor that's online today has two nominally identical uh, copies of our uh, earlier generation 40 Q chip. Uh, we're currently, um, you know, uh, looking at early 2023, uh, changing architecture to a larger uh, tileable unit cell um, that uh, we anticipate to have uh, significantly higher fidelity than our uh, previous generation. Um, that chip, uh, just like the prior, um, uh, you know, scales in this kind of tileable pattern. Um, so our target uh, by the end of next year is to have uh, four of these chips uh, integrated into a modular processor. Um, and here are their names: um, uh, Anka, uh, which is means star in uh, in a language, and uh, Lyra, uh, which is a, a constellation in the sky. Uh, here's a picture of our data center. Um, Rigetti is uh, you know, a very collaborative institution. I think you'll see that um, with you know, some of the subsequent slides. If you're in Berkeley and want to drop by, um, please drop me a note. Uh, here's our uh, fab facility in Fremont um, as of about a year or two ago. Um, something really exciting that's happening <clears throat> right now is um, uh, uh, we're actually expanding um, this facility to increase our uh, R&D bandwidth as well as fold in some, some new capabilities. Again, we have about, uh, you know, almost all of our processing steps in house and uh, this expansion is, is really an opportunity to, to accelerate uh, the hardware advancements that we're planning. Um, a couple of the results that uh, I'll be sharing um, are based on uh, this uh, large national QIS research center called SQMS uh, that we're part of. Uh, uh, Norm uh, spoke earlier, he's uh, one of our algorithms thrust leaders I'm the CTO of the center. A bulk of the um, uh, program is, is really about addressing uh, decoherence and material science in superconducting qubits. Um, and like Norm said, there's, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to, to think about how HPC can be brought to bear on those problems. Um, and you know, definitely uh, reach out if you have uh, good ideas there. Um, but it's a, you know, a multi-institution uh, program. And um, I'll be sharing some, some highlights um, from, from uh, you know, Norm's work and others. Um, <clears throat> in the following slides. 
Great. Um, another uh, kind of programmatic high level thing um, to call out. So while um, Rigetti processors are available in uh, multiple public clouds, including AWS Bracket and Microsoft Azure, um, we also have a partnership uh, with Oak Ridge that makes these um, resources available to the researchers who have you know, ongoing funding from uh, DOE. Um, and you know, there's a there's a growing uh, quantum community uh, there. I think that there's also some some interesting um, you know opportunities to to think about how to you know develop that further model further. Um, but it, it's based on a, a long going uh, collaboration um, where you know <laughs> uh, some some of our good friends there were, were some of the the first people to to, to use our quantum computers uh, for, for science. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we really pride ourselves at, at uh, Rigetti on is uh, speed. So, um, based on you know uh, published benchmarks um, to date, our systems have uh, the highest uh, circuit layer operations per second, which is a benchmark that uh, our, our very good friends at, at um, uh, IBM uh, put out. Um, uh, it's it's really exciting, you know, that uh, we we didn't develop that benchmark, but um, the effort that we've been making around building out. Uh, hybrid uh, computational engines, you know, carried forth, uh, you know, to, to that benchmark. So as we look to, you know, develop uh, generic, um, you know, benchmarks, I think this this notion of, of trying to fold in speed is really important. Uh, a lot of what you'll be seeing at, at, out of this talk, uh, you know, are these um, variational algorithms that, that very much depend on, on that. Um, I grabbed this pie chart um, from a number, I, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, Austin down there. Um, uh, it's not up to date. I think this is uh, 2018. Um, but I wanted to share just I think that there there are kind of a, a broad set of users uh, here today. Um, I just wanted to call out um, places where we have active uh, algorithms work at Rigetti uh, right now. Um, so this isn't even capturing or reflecting what um, the broader user base of you know, people who are you know just uh, using our computers over the cloud. These are really um, Places where where Rigetti is working in co-design with algorithms and and end user experts, um, and uh, I was happy to see that it's you know more than half a pie, um, and uh, it sounds sounds delicious. Um, so I'll, I'll give a couple highlights um, from some of these um, just to give you a sense of the kinds of prototype applications, scale, and, and benchmarks that people are seeing. Uh, just going around the pie. Um, so one of the <laughs> kind of flagship. Um, SQMS uh, algorithms that's being developed is applying um, variational quantum eigensolver um, to study the um, Kitaev uh, model. So this is a topological uh, spin lattice. And um, there's been three or I think three papers out of SQMS. Uh, I put the most recent here. Um, an observation that was made as part of the like coming together of uh, field theorists and hardware people. Um, was that there was a way to map this spin model onto uh, Rigetti's hardware topology. Um, so, you know, double use of the word topology, but, you know, the idea is that um, the spin couplings uh, that we want to simulate um, are represented by hardware native uh, two qubit operations. So we don't have a whole lot of overhead for swap networks and this kind of thing, which in the kind of NISCI era um, is really important. Um, so, you know, the group uh, is is looking at um, kind of topological properties of this model. Um, something that's you know exciting within the center is that they're also testing you know combinations of uh, error mitigation and looking at how uh, these systems scale under uh, realistic noise. Um, that's uh, it's pretty fun. Um, obviously, Fermilab is is uh, the lead institution in the center, so there's a lot of high energy physics going on. Um, and uh, in ONSOTS and an algorithm that's been uh, developed and is under test right now um, uh, looks at uh, D4 gauge theory. Um, and uh, here's a picture of it. Um, I'm not a high energy physicist, um, so I'm not going to explain the picture. Um, but there's matter fields and gauge fields and some interesting uh, phasing uh, between occupied states and unoccupied states. Um, one thing that I uh, have picked up from this is that the um, uh, the theory is a, um, uh, it comes with kind of a set of group operators that can be re represented by quantum circuits. And uh, the team, um, uh, which, you know, is at, at Fermilab and, and a number of our, um, uh, you know, institutional participants in SQMS has, has benchmarked 
um, the kind of uh, basic building blocks of, of those group operators on hardware. Um, and uh, so this is kind of a, a building block towards, towards larger scale simulations. These gauge theories are interesting because there are properties um, such as like, you know, coupling constants and, and dynamics that are very, very hard to, to calculate with a, with a sign problem. And um, even our kind of, um, so I understand it, even our best numerical techniques kind of have 100% of uncertainty. Um, so there's really an opportunity here, I think, um, <clears throat> with respect to co-design uh, to, to really understand these models better. Um, something <clears throat> maybe surprising to folks, um, uh, one of the slices of pie was uh, climate and earth modeling. Um, this is, you know, this is not a, a quantum mechanical problem. This is a classical data um, uh, problem. However, it's really complex uh, data, um, and uh, that is actually pretty interesting <clears throat> from a quantum, uh, you know, algorithms uh, development perspective. Um, the concept that that we were working with um, in this uh, climate modeling work um, is a problem in uh, generative modeling, which is um, given um, <clears throat> some uh, highly available data sets, such as overhead satellite imagery, uh, data from numerical models, can you infer uh, what the weather you know, pattern actually is? Um, so over the course of a year or so, um, uh, we developed this uh, hybrid uh, quantum classical um, uh, classification model. Uh, and the basic idea is that um, by embedding your classical data into a kind of quantum vector space or Hilbert space. That's you know a much larger vector space. Uh, it's a very common trick in machine learning to to raise your uh, problem into a higher dimensional space where it's easier to solve. Um, and so that was that was the inspiration. Um, this uh, uh, column here uh, labeled uh, QNN is is the output of our model. Um, and again, we see um, with a lot of these um, <clears throat> empirical benchmarks in in QML. Um, the results weren't strictly better than classical, um, but they were different and, and kind of open up um, uh, some, some interesting directions. Um, but one thing um, that, that we're really excited about uh, with respect to this data set involves um, some uh, extensions to uh, quantum kernel methods. So just to you know, quickly um, give, a, give a highlight here, and I'll, I'll give a shout out uh, to the Penny Lane tutorials that were mentioned in the last talk. Um, it's definitely the one-stop shop for you know, learn all this kind of stuff. And there's, I think, numerous uh, tutorials on, on kernel methods in quantum that are, that are super duper handy. So definitely pop over to uh, Penny Lane uh, to, to check that out. Um, but the basic concept in uh, a quantum uh, kernel calculation is to try to estimate the similarity between two data vectors. So you have two data vectors, uh, X sub I and X sub J, and you encode those uh, data vectors into your quantum circuit instruction. And uh, the, the way this uh, works conceptually is um, that you build up a, a large, uh, highly dimensional, uh, you know, unitary um, out of that uh, parameterized um, uh, data input, and then you unwind that unitary. So you see there's kind of a, a mirror in time here. And uh, you, you dagger, uh, should give you the identity if uh, xi and xj are equivalent. Um, this is analogous to the kind of classical uh, support vector machine. And what this gives you is a way of measuring uh, distance between uh, two vectors um, in some uh, kind of quantum model. What's very exciting about this is that uh, Huang et al. Uh, showed uh, just last year that um, there are geometrical measures that you can apply to the uh, data vectors that, that we were just talking about. Um, as well as the, ta the task associated with, with um, that, that kernel estimator. And um, what they give you is essentially a, a, a flow chart for determining whether the problem has the potential for quantum advantage. And um, what we find by working with this high dimensional classical data um, that represents satellite imagery, numerical models, is that the, <clears throat> that classical data is actually sufficiently complex uh, to support uh, quantum advantage. Turns out when we do the other test about the difficulty of the classification problem at hand, uh, that was actually easy enough that you know a classical computer is is probably the right resource for it. Um, but it's these hints that you know real world data may actually have 
um, interesting properties uh, to try to investigate uh, with, with, with quantum machine learning. Um, so uh, just to give a sense of, of how we're thinking about uh, these, these benchmarks. So we have these uh, empirical tests by building out models, building out benchmarks, um, coming at this from a uh, simulation perspective, um, we're also interested in uh, regions where um, with increasing uh, qubit count, um, we can start to chart out uh, regions where uh, it's actually really difficult uh, to, to simulate the output of the quantum computer. And this feeds into, um, in our opinion, kind of, uh, you know, it, they're kind of guideposts for quantum advantage. So basically, if we can still simulate uh, the system uh, on a laptop or on Perlmutter very efficiently, you know, it's unlikely that that problem complexity and that problem construction uh, is a path towards quantum advantage. So we're using this uh, as, as input uh, at Rigetti to how we, you know, develop benchmarks uh, internally for our hardware as well as um, uh, for applications writ large. So there's, you know, uh, the kind of gold standard of, of kind of state vector simulations that give you everything um, with uh, noisy near-term uh, uh, quantum computers, that noise is often represented with more efficient approximate methods such as uh, Feynman path integrals uh, or kind of approximate uh, simulations uh, thereof. Um, and uh, so, you know, one of the important things to, for us to try to understand is what is the role of uh, noise in understanding the, the difficulty of, of uh, reproducing the output of our uh, quantum hardware. Um, with, within the uh, you know, techniques of, of tensor networks, uh, as, as Maxime has taught us, is that um, uh, the difficulty of uh, simulating uh, you know, perfect quantum computers is exponential in uh, this uh, control parameter, which is the bond dimension of your tensor network simulation, where uh, you know, in a perfect quantum computer, it's exponential in, in the size of the Hilbert space. However, under increasing uh, noise, we expect that the fidelity is actually lower. And uh, so you can represent the output of the quantum circuit with a smaller and smaller bond dimension. Um, this is kind of a pictorial view is that, you know, you kind of have this uh, fuzzing of a fixture um, if we're using these kind of matrix product states uh, to compress the entanglement. Um, so what we're looking at uh, here is, is kind of, you know, can we uh, calibrate an approximate simulator to, to represent the hard, quantum hardware noise? Um, and to put that quantitatively, like what is the bond dimension that we associate with the output of one of our circuits? Um, now this framework uh, we believe is, is highly general to whatever you know, circuit onsets, you may need a different tensor network representation depending on you know, exactly the, the algorithm that you're running. Um, but just as a test case for us, we're looking at these uh, graph problems uh, on max cut. Um, there, there's a cost function, uh, which is uh, you know, represented by this kind of uh, sum of ZZs. Um, and you know, don't need to worry about uh, too much how the algorithm works. Um, but its structure has these uh, layers associated with it um, that involve uh, the application of a, a cost Hamiltonian, which is the exponentiation of the ZZ. That's where all the entanglement happens. It's also where a lot of the noise happens. Um, and you know we're, we're measuring on the Z basis. Um, here's uh, a view of what the output of uh, this circuit on SOTS uh, looks like um, in an approximate simulator where we're tuning uh, the bond dimension. Basically, you see that uh, the contrast uh, is is decreasing. Um, here, there's there's an exact uh, score uh, for, for your QAUA output uh, of, of 4.2, um, but under the uh, kind of um, noise, uh, it's it's decreasing. What we can see is that we can kind of uh, fit the output of our um, hardware to, to to such a onsets um, and and uh, give it a, an effective fidelity. Um, but what's uh, really exciting is that um, we can, uh, with, with um, uh, the resources uh, that were awarded to us uh, through uh, the QIS program at, at Promoter, uh, able to extend this up to uh, large lattices with under approximate simulation um, and figure out uh, under kind of somewhat realistic models of, of hardware noise, uh, how much uh, fidelity do we need in order to kind of saturate the bond dimension sufficiently large um, 
in order to uh, kind of put us into this um, advantage possible you know, region. And I would just say um, uh, there are much better techniques for solving these graph problems than an exact simulation of uh, QAOA. Um, and you know, we, we definitely recognize that. But what we're trying to understand is uh, you know, how, how, uh, you know, how much fidelity um, do we need from a, a hardware perspective to push the sampling problem uh, into uh, into this kind of uh, you know quantum advantage uh, possible regime? And uh, yeah, I would say that we've uh, learned a lot from that. Um, check out this paper, and it gives some some quantitative goalposts uh, for for that. Um, uh, I'm at time, um, but uh, one thing that I just want to conclude on is that you know it's very exciting times. Um, this uh, conversation and others. You know, raise a bunch of questions. Um, here's some of what we're thinking about. Um, thinking about taking an explore exploratory approach, building out you know multiple different kinds of systems with different types of integration, and, and really kind of um, you know doing doing a lot of uh, you know quick turn uh, prototyping is, is kind of in our blood. So um, I'll stop there. I'm happy. To